And I'd now like to invite our president, honorary president, Alan Schenkin, to take over. Thank you. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Gary Frost, who is, uh, was last year's win uh, winner of the annual prize. And with that comes the delights of offering a lecture to us in the following year. Um, I've had the opportunity over many years to follow Gary's career and his research activity, so I was not at all surprised when he was awarded the BNF Prize last year. His career is well summarised in the programme, but this hardly does justice to his extensive and productive research, um, for which he has gained an international reputation. Over, over 40 years, he has progressively developed his interests in carbohydrate metabolism, linking these to diabetes and obesity. One example was his team being the first to show the effect of a low glycemic diet on adipocyte metabolism. His work has always been focused on achieving clinical benefit, either to individual patients or on a public health basis. He now has a special interest in behavioural change and weight loss. I was impressed to note when I was scanning the internet that he, he presented some of his work at the World Economic Forum in Davos in 2018, a food solution to the double burden of malnutrition, it was entitled. He truly has an international impact. So I now invite him to give the 2021 annual lecture entitled From Food to Molecules and Back Again. As an aside, when I first had to read that carefully, because when I first saw it, I read it as food to molecules and back pain. <laughs> so, uh, so that, I guess, was also possible given the ergonomic restrictions of laboratory work, etc. But, uh, but, but, but Gary, I think your title's better. So, <laughs> so we look forward to your lecture. Um, Committee members of BNF, I'm so grateful for you inviting me to give this talk today. And to the audience here and online, I did ask Roy how long I've got, and he came back and said, well, somewhere between about 30 minutes and 45 might do. And I thought, well, people haven't got very much to do at the moment, you know, so <laughs> how long will 120 slides take <laughs> to go through? So I, I am incredibly grateful. It's lovely to actually talk about um, a, a length of science over a period of time and how it's changed over the years. And I'm also I'm going to flip the talk a little bit and say a big thank you to everyone that supported me. Now, this is a danger slide, because people will look at that and say, bloody hell, I'm not on it. <laughs> and, that, and, that, and it's really hard to do this uh, fairly, but it, it is done fairly. And some of you might be surprised to see yourself on it. But the two people up at the top left, many of you will know Tony Leeds, and many of you will know Steve Bloom. And without them and their support to take on a dietitian, uh, in, the, in the late 80s, who already had a track record and mentored them through a PhD, I will be internally great, grateful to. And likewise, to Christine, who I believe is somewhere down here, and Jasper Alcuna for sitting in a, uh, in a tiny room at King's and actually uh, doing my PhD, Viva, and the advice that they gave to me at that time has stuck with me for the rest of my career. For those people that watch only, uh, is it only Connect, the programme, the quiz programme? Uh, this is quite good for that. Because uh, you could work out eminent nutritional scientists whose first name begins with J. And you can make a complete line of those in this. I'll put it back up at the end, so if you want to play other, other, other games as well. But there's too many people here to mention. I'm going to mention one of the set for those people who are coming next. I think this is incredibly important. You know, uh, sometimes you look around and see a lot of grey hair around. And I continually worry about what's happened to the next generation. But in here, on this slide here, there are people who think very differently about nutrition. Isabel Garcia up the top, Ed Chambers again. Uh, Joram Posma, I have lost, he's over here, who's a biostatistician. 
they all think in completely different ways to what I do. And there, I think, you know, the field is in safe hands if we can encourage them to apply their science. Not, neither of them are, 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 are nutritionists. But if we can get them to apply their, their very careful, detailed science, some of which you'll see in the next, next hour or so. Right? <laughs> and again, I wouldn't be standing here without these people. So this is my wife, Val, Andrew, and Kirsty, who have been there all the way through my career and supported me. And we are very lucky as academics. Uh, we don't have very much um, uh, people telling us what to do. But the overspill for that is long weekends and very many holidays trying to raise in grants against time. And they've been nothing but supportive. So thank you. And to the funders as well, it's really important. We wouldn't be able to present any of the work without that. And the UKRI collection of funders, NIHR, etc., all go without saying. But also I would like to highlight here, and it's always very difficult, but I'm a great believer that, you know, we, have, we heard this morning about the fact that we live in um, systems, complex systems, and without welcoming those people that play a major role in those complex systems into the research environment, we're never going to get an, an, anywhere. So I'm just as proud of the, the relationships and the grants that we've received from industry as I am to the relationship and grants that I have with UKRI. They're in different fields. They actually um, have enabled us to actually move things forward where we wouldn't be able to actually uh, um, work. Okay, and this is a slide, that, not that you've seen before, but it has the same message of many that you've seen at all, a, um, uh, a bit earlier on today. So again, we cannot get away from the fact that we, our society is dominated by non-communicable disease, that, that the major public health pro problems that we face is are related to our lifestyles. And that a big part of that is diet, and that plays a central role. And this jigsaw is deliberately actually chosen because it, it says that there are interconnected pieces here. I'm going to present just one piece of that, but I do go back to that foresight report and that very complex uh, systems map. And I think, again, we need to go back and think about how we actually put the bits of these jigsaws together so that we can actually address these situations. So the relationship between food and our physiology drives health across the lifestyle. And that's the premise I'm going to come with. So the next slide will strike horror into very many dietitians who are my age in the audience. And this is McCanson Widdison and how it used to look like. You know? And I show you this because the first point that I'd like to make is that for most people of my era, the whole bit about food consisted of about 30 nutrients. So if you actually look at this, that's all we were doing. And the big changes that we're seeing now are far more wider than that. And I think we need to actually understand, so this is work by Isabel Garcia, looking at the metabolomic profile of a diet as we go through the day, and the molecules that that food actually contains. Now, I'm not pretending that these are nutrients, they're not, but they are bioactive molecules. They're bioactive molecules that make a difference to physiology. And unless we actually understand the wider view of the food that we eat, and that's why food's there, not nutrition, the wider view of food that we eat and the actual impact it makes on our physiology, then I think we become a little bit stuck. And the other side of the coin is, that, again, something someone mentioned this this morning, about how important food structure is. And forgive those people in the audience that see that this slide beforehand. But this is a picture of a food item that you may be able to guess at. But consuming this, running around trying to capture this and eat corn, is very different to actually processing it and ending up with this. So the structure of our food, and I'm going to try and present something, and I'm going to be very clear, I'm not talking about ultra-processed foods here. I'm talking about the structure of the food that we eat. 
And the other thing in science which I want to try and actually get back to is that we do fragmented science. So we're, we're very good at focusing in one bit, our one specialist bit of the body. You know, there's a lots of people who are now very interested in the colon and the microbiota. But in reality, it's all connected. You know, and what affects the colon, well, the, the colon at the end is affected by the small intestine, the small intestine, stomach and the mouth. And without understanding the whole of this, which is a major challenge and needs to be embraced, we're not going to move forward very quickly. And we can put these two together in the field that I live, which is uh, complex carbohydrates or carbohydrates. Here you've got the two forms of starch, amylose and amylopectin, which all have its own physiological response. Again, we'll come back and talk a little bit about that later on. But then it's wrapped up in very clever ways. It's wrapped up into starch granules. Those starch granules are behave very differently. It's then got a cell wall wrapped around it. And again, the actual composition of the cell wall makes its food behave differently. And then it has an outer seed coat. And that outer seed coat actually, again, makes a difference to the way that this food is actually digested. And I'm not going to apologize. I love glycemic index. I spent most of my early career in glycemic index. And whichever way you look at it, if you eat a bowl of pasta and the equivalent amount of bread, there is a difference. There is a postprandial difference to your blood glucose. And it's, and it's kind of fallen out of actual favour. But nonetheless, you can, for many people, and particularly those people that are still here that work in supermarkets, this became fashionable about 20 odd years ago. And we can produce ranking lists. And if you put those ranking lists together, so if you actually consume a diet that is mainly low glycemic index food, I am absolutely convinced that that has an effect on postprandial blood glucose, just as David Jenkins and his team showed in this very clean, randomised controlled trial of free living people, that this made in the, the equivalent of an HbA1c of about... Uh, uh, I think it's about half, uh, half a percent difference, which is highly clinical rel relevant if you're at risk or living with, 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 with diabetes. So this makes a difference, and it fell out of favour. And the, one of the reasons why it fell out of favour was because people said, well, I, I've got to show off as well. This is our contribution to the field, by the way. <laughs> well, but we'll skip that, OK? So I am associated with it. The reason why it fell out of favour was because people said it was too variable. That you couldn't really understand it. You gave it to someone and people would differ. And again, this is a number of points that I'll highlight several times again. We are, we are talking about food. We are not talking about pharmaceuticals. The actual physiology about food is completely different and needs to be actually wrapped up and embraced in a different way. And it took 20 years before this paper came out. So this is Zeevee's paper. And to my mind, it's in my mind, on all sorts of points, it's a landmark paper. This, this paper embraced the variation that you saw in postprandial blood glucose with a low glycemic index diet. And what they chased was why that variation was occurring. So they looked at a huge range of physiological markers. They looked at a huge range of lifestyle questionnaires. And they also did in-depth microbiota measurements. I'm not going to go into each one of those um, uh, in detail. I mean, they, they're very much a microbiome group, so you would expect them to say that the microbiome is important, and in their models it came out. But the important thing that they showed was that the postprandial glycemia was predictable. That if you took into account individual differences, you could predict very clearly where people would lie. And not only that, if you actually wrapped up an, uh, a carbohydrate in a certain way, you could actually get benefit in people that didn't respond as good as other people. So this is really important. This is personalised nutrition at the cutting edge of science at the time when it was published a few years ago. And at the same time, 
We were messing around a little bit, was continue with glycemic. We were a bit in tears because of the decline of glycemic index, but never mind. We thought, well, we can actually take, 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 take on with that. So we started to look, again, totally independently of what Zili's group was, is, is if we understood that most glycemic index foods contain either resistant starch or dietary fibre, where does that end up? Well, the vast majority of it, of, of, of it ends up in the large intestine. And when I started my career out, people would say, well, that stuff just travels through you and out the other side, and it was actually inert. And we know now that that's not the case. And, and people are actually making their careers out of understanding the colonic environment and the microbiota. So we became very interested in fermentation and in particular the molecules that are produced from fermentation. So acetate, propionate and butyrate. And at that particular time, it became really interesting because just as the 2000 change, there was a description of a, a short chain fatty acid receptor. So a, a series, two receptors were de-orphaned and actually shown that they actually bind these three short chain fatty acids that are produced by the microbiota from dietary fiber or, 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 or resistant starch firm, fermentation. And the interesting thing from our point of view is that these are expressed on the neuroendocrine L cell. Again, so this the neuroendocrine L cell is a cell that's actually, that sits within your intestine that actually has a hormonal content. And the ones in the colon, which, are, which are, were termed L cells, actually release two, well, they release a number of hormones, but the two of interest were PYY and GLP-1. So these two hormones, GLP-1, many of you will know, is an incretin, whereas PYY has a role in appetite regulation. So we thought, well, is some of what we're seeing with low glycemic index diet and the high fiber content due to this, due to the fact that you can actually uh, see that, that, that these um, uh, molecules are hitting these receptors and these receptors are producing these hormones that actually have an effect both on blood glucose and appetite reg regulation. Here's a little diagram of the actual intestine, the, uh, the actual um, areas where some of the hormones are produced. The ones that we were interested in from the neuroendocrine L cell are particularly in the colon, so very hard to reach. And why are they important? Well, they're important because we know that the bigger meal that you eat, the more you release. We've all sat down and had a wonderful lunch just now. If you ate all of it, you will excrete more PYY, feel more satiated than someone that only had the starter. Very reproducible. We also know that if you infuse it, and this is again one of my mentors for a long time, Steve Bloom, Professor Steve Bloom, work, that if you infuse PYY, then you see measurable effects on decreasing in, 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 in intake to such an extent that this has been taken up by pharmaceutical com companies now. And in the case of GLP-1, very many of you will know that the actual analogues of GLP-1 are now used to treat type 2 diabetes. So they are very important hormones. And again, for those that work in the obesity field, it's thought that the release of uh, PYY, GLP-1, and another molecule <coughs> called oxyntomodulin drives some of the effects that you see from bariatric surgery. So you mess around with someone's intestines, you deliver more stuff into the colon that shouldn't be there, and you actually get a big spike of actual PYY and a suppression of appetite. And that, that last bit is really important because we have a bit of a philosophical debate here. And again, for those people that have seen I like gorillas. Gorillas are wonderful things. Um, for lots of reasons. But they eat this stuff. You know, if, if we didn't go around, if they didn't have problems with humans, they'd be highly successful mam mam mammals. But nonetheless, they eat this stuff. And they eat, eat, eat it in huge quantities. 
And if they had a system, their, their, their colons, very similar to ours, they produce bucketfuls of short-chain fatty acids. So if they suppress their appetite in response to short-chain fatty acids, they would have died out years ago as, as, as a species. So the point is here that you need to give things a big kick if you're going to actually uh, get a response to some of the systems that we're talking, particularly around appetite reg reg regulation. So if you look at the research, so the people that do mouse experiments, if you look at how much fiber or resistant starch they're given to produce an effect, it's 10% by weight of the diet. So that would mean around about a, a, a a quarter of your meal that you've just consumed would be resistant starch to actually get to this level. Whereas in humans, we know at the present time we eat less than one. And that makes an awful lot of sense. You know, that, that, that to get an appetite suppression, which is against the survival of the species, you need to, you, you need to give the system a kick. And that was actually um, demonstrated by one of our PhD students some time ago now. Who, did, uh, who got very frustrated with me because most of her PhD was highly negative. We were showing very low amounts of actually, um, uh, or putting in low amounts into people. And until she was very brave, and this is inulin, so those people that don't know inulin's uh, a molecule, a dietary fiber molecule that gets into the colon and is highly fermented. So again, it's, these are huge quantities at the top end that you were seeing. And it's not until you get to there that you start to see the release of these hormones, PYY and GLP-1. So not until you get to very, very high amounts. And we were also able to show that the exposure to this constant short-chain fatty acid environment increased the population of the cells that release these peptides. So exposure of the epithelial surface in the colon to a high amount of actual acetate, propionate, and butyrate increases the cells that actually reside there. And again, then we come up to another problem. Is this, if this is going to be useful in humans, we know that actually it's, it's quite challenging for people to eat 30 grams of dietary fiber per day. So what could we do? So in partnership with a colleagues in the University of Glasgow who are now very, very close friends, Douglas Morrison and Tom Preston. We actually developed a delivery system. And the reason for de developing the delivery system, because if you try and eat short-chain fatty acids, they are horrible. They are actually vile things. The closest that you can actually, the, the nicest one of all of them is acetate, which is vinegar. But try propionate, uh, 10 grams of propionate in the morning is not very good at all. And, so, and taken rap rapidly, they're, rap they're, they're, they're absorbed very high up in the colon, so they don't, uh, in the small intestine, so they don't get to the colon. So we actually try to, to use inulin as a delivery system, because we know that inulin doesn't actually get, get uh, uh, affected by the small intestinal environment and we can actually esterify the short-chain fatty acids. So you've made a carrier system, a food carrier system, which actually is not unaffected by the, the small intestinal environment. But when we get into the colon, what you see is the actual microbiota actually starting to attack the inulin, ferment the inulin mole molecule, and what you have is a release of the short-chain fatty acid, in this case, pro propionate. Most of our work focuses on pro propionate for a number of reasons, not least the two receptors, free fatty acid receptor two and three. If you put them together, their affinity is greatest for pro propionate. And what we were hypothesizing, if we can increase that flux of propionate in the colon, then you can stimulate a release of PYY and GLP-1. So we, we gave uh, the initial studies, the first in man studies, if you want, to um, a bunch of volunteers at Hammersmith, and we could actually demonstrate very clearly when this molecule arrives in the human colon, you get this wonderful spike of PYY. So this line here is the line when we know this molecule's got into the colon because it carries a, a, a label on it. 
And again, this graph here at the bottom just shows it very, very clearly that you have nothing in the small intestine. Then when you get into the large intestine, you get this actual big spike of PYY and GLP-1. And that actually related to a suppression of appetite. And then we went on one step further and we did a randomised, a small randomised, proof of principle ran, randomised controlled trial in overweight adults to try and see if this prevented an increase in body weight. So this is not about weight loss. It's a total different kettle of fish dealing with that. This is about taking people and preventing the actual uh, consistent weight gain that you see. And again, there is very clear benefit from this molecule in this small number of volunteers. And this is now has been funded by NIHR, uh, the EME pro program, and uh, we're currently um, finished recruiting 300 young adults into a trial to see whether this actually stands up at the present time as far as a, a potential um, uh, food system uh, addition. And it's also, uh, as far as we're aware, uh, gone through the EFSA process and we're just waiting for the final outcome of that at the present time. So it's highly possible that this might be translated in, 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 into some kind of food system. So this is one molecule with two receptors. Food contains thou thousands of molecules. And when you eat, you create an intestinal molecular storm. But we had a very pharmaceutical approach to what we do. And again, I want to try and broaden that. If you are dealing with food, should we really be looking at one molecule, one receptor? Should we not be embracing and pushing the boundaries of science? Uh, and again, I remind you just what you're actually looking at when you're talking about food again. This slide took a long time. To be, so uh, it, 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 you'll see it again before the end. <laughs> okay. And not only that, is that, again, working in an environment at Hammersmith Hospital, we're very lucky where we have an interventional clinical research facility, and that allows us to actually reach parts of the, other t the intestine that other people can't reach. So this is intubation work. What this is actually trying to show you, that there's no figures or anything on this other than pretty graphs and blue lines. But what you've got to actually get the impression of, this is what you've just seen on that slide of the molecules rolling about. So this is the NMR profile of that. So this is what happens after you eat that meal. So the actual profile changes because it's enriched with other molecules from the digestive process or other bits of food are broken down and they produce a different molecule. Whoops, sorry about that. And then when it gets into the duodenum, the same and the colon, the same. So not only do we have a, a gap in our knowledge about the molecules in food, we have a gap in our knowledge about the, mole the molecules as they travel through the intestine and what actually they're doing. And this forms a large part of the work that we're doing at the moment because we know there are many, many, many nutrient receptors in the intestine. And I'm going to bring you back now to whole food. Same story, same complexity. This is the actual Crestar study that was funded by BBSRC Drink. The last work as well was funded by BBSRC Drink. But this was about wrinkled peas, okay? Um, this is uh, uh, Katharina, who was a PhD student who actually coordinated this. And I can honestly say without her central coordination in it, this wouldn't happen. So this is her um, uh, receiving her award at the Houses of Parliament for the work that she'd done. So this is one of the STEM awards. So she was, uh, she was fantastic. She's just had a baby, by the way. But not like, you know, so what, what we're talking about in this project is these things, these two things here. This is, this is a round pea and this is a wrinkled pea. And for those people who don't remember anything about wrinkled peas, if I take you back to oh, an A-level um, uh, uh, um, exams, this is Mendel's peas, the wrinkled ones are the Mendel, Mendelian peas. Yeah? 
So they've been around for a long, long time. And the reason why they're wrinkled is because they have less water content. And the reason why they have less water content is because they've got more of this stuff, these linear uh, amylose mo mo molecules. And that's the difference between the two peas. That this wrinkled pea has a, gen a natural genetic fault that it's unable to produce amylopectin in significant quantities. So it's got highly resistant starch. And when we started out with this project, it was very simple what we were thinking about. This is fantastic. There's a pea out there with a, res with, with, with a natural mutation. We can do lots of stuff with that. It's got resistant starch. And we can actually uh, affect people's postprandial blood glucose. We didn't call it glycemic index, but it is. It's glycemic index. Uh, so that, again, so here you've got the wild type P, the big R, and the actual uh, mutant P, the little r. And again, dramatic effects on postprandial blood glucose. Forgive me, the scale's different here for the insulin, but again, you couldn't put it on the same scale because the insulin would disappear. But again, dramatic effects on, 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 on insulin. So this is a whole food item now. Having a, and as I said, we were, we were absolutely convinced that this was all down to the fact that this actually contained um, res resistant starch. But you get a clue that things aren't really like that. Because if you look at the difference between the flour and the pea in each case, it's, it's very, very different. So the actual pea actually flattens the blood glucose curve more than the flour. So structure here becomes very, very important. And the structure in the actual wrinkled pea is, becomes very important. And to get at that, we did some studies and you get bullied in your actual life. So this is me with a couple of tubes, one into the duodenum and one into the stomach, to try and get at what is going on with these, the, these structures as they travel through the intestine. And what we discovered, again, welcoming in other people into your research with a bunch of engineers, is that they fracture in a different way. So the two, the two types of peas fracture in a different way. So the little RP, when it's crushed, when it's cooked and crushed, forms bigger lumps. And those bigger lumps actually remain bigger lumps as they travel through. They get smaller, but they're always bigger than the actual wild type pea. <laughs> Here we are, there you are. This, this, this is my uh, duodenal content, <laughs> by the way. Um, and what you can see here, so this is the actual duodenal glucose, the bottom lines here. This is the duodenal glucose, not plasma glucose, this is duodenal glucose. So the environment, what's ha happening at that time. And again, you can see that the actual little RP is not releasing as much. And the fantastic work, again, a star of the future, Kat Edwards at Quadrum has done some brilliant work where she's used staining of am amylase to actually look at what's happening within those chunks as they travel through the pea. And the cell wall barrier is very different in these two. Very, very different at all. And just think what we could do by harnessing that. You could actually create a natural delivery system for different food, diff different types of molecules, different types of nutrients. So if we understand what it is within the cell walls of these, 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 bio, um, these, these, these plants, it opens up a whole new field. The other thing that, I, that we come back to is, if you remember the, Z, the ZZ pa 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 paper, we too, when you start regressing things to the mean, show a very different postprandial uh, blood glucose responses between all of these individuals. Okay? So not everyone's the same. Not everybody responds the same to this particular food. And you can see participant uh, um, uh, eight is very different from participant three, etc. wherever you actually look on this graph. Okay? So again, there's something about unwinding that. So we got very excited. We thought, wow, this is it, this is the microbiota doing everything known to mankind. So again, we did another study with this, we did a randomized crossover study where we're actually trying to interrogate whether we've made a change to the microbiota and whether that change actually relates to those differences in the glucose curve. 
And this was very disappointing because it did nothing. So the actual, what, what you're seeing up here is a very different um, methodology. So here you have people who have consumed peas for, 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 for just about four weeks. And we know that they consume them because there's a biomarker in peas that we can actually pick up, uh, tr trigonolin. So these people were, were, had high compliance to this. We got changes in the microbiota, which you can see here. The organisms aren't important, but you can actually see the differences. But it made no difference to their postprandial blood glucose. And again, another important message about this is that that small intestinal environment is very important. We shouldn't get dragged down some of the actual... Um, some, some of the trends that are happening in, in, in science. But the actual, sm how, how cells and plant materials form barriers to smaller digestive enzymes becomes very, very important. So we went back, went back to the drawing board. And the next set of work I'm going to show you is really driven by Isabel Garcia and Joram Pos Posma. Is, 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 Isabel is a is a chemist by background uh, who's applied most of her skills to nutrition now. And Joram Pos Posma is a, is a data scientist. Again, a chemist by back, 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 background. So what we did is that we tried to uh, take a, to understand this variability. We actually took a group of volunteers. Uh, we locked them up. Again, we've got very, really nice things at, uh, at the hospital where we're able to lock people up for, for, for a week at a time. So these people very kindly came in for four weeks. Each time they were given exactly the same thing to eat for breakfast, lunch and the evening meal. No variation here. And they were followed everywhere they went. So we know that they took everything. We know what they took. We know they didn't actually have anything other than what they were given. And this is important because this actually reduces the variability. And you can see from this little cloud here. So that little red cloud is the metabolomic profile of each individual on the unhealthy diet, this one here. Whereas the blue cloud is on the very healthy diet. And they separate. Even with a small number of volunteers, they separate very, very clearly. So we can actually separate people. And we know that from the work that Isabel does that, we can get lots of markers. So in, in that urine is a huge number of markers that relate directly to what food that you've eaten. So we start to build up a methodology. However, we still have variability, even within that actual very strict environment that these people were in for those those weak periods for four weeks. So you can see here, if we just pick one of them out, uh, let's say carn carnitine, it's real, as, as you know, carnitine is related to, to, to muscle protein, so not, not surprisingly with the higher muscle, it's, it's higher on the unhealthy diet. But look at the spread in the data. So there is still something here about people's variability despite actually coming over. And, and again, Isabel and Joram were absolutely fascinated by this. And what they started to do was to take these profiles apart. They started to actually build up new ways of looking at profiles. And this is what they've termed the dietary metabotype score, which is the score of your whole profile. This isn't selecting molecules. This is taking the thousands of molecules from with, 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 within your NMR spectra, some of which we don't know at the moment, and creating a score for an individual. And the, the point about this is you can see on this graph here that you've got, again, variability across individuals. But what starts to come out is that certain individuals are always low and certain individuals are always high. So certain people produce a load of molecules in the urine in response to a diet, doesn't matter which one. And certain people actually don't produce as many. And is that important as far as health goes? Does this underlie some of the actual uh, observations that have made by other people about variability in diet? 
Again, we could link this to postprandial blood glucose. So this is the same volunteers. Those that actually have a high DMS ranking, so those people that are, 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 are producing a lot of molecules in the urine, have the lowest blood glucose. Those people that produce less have a higher blood glucose. And likewise, again, Isabel's got to be credited by this. She took, she took an absolute punt and just decided that, well, I'll measure some energy in urine. And again, what started to appear out of that is that the people with a high DMS had a high urinary energy out, 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 output. So the question is, is that does the actual molecules that you produce in your urine and the amount that you produce actually relate to long-term health. Now, I want everyone to keep their fingers crossed next because this might not work. It's been a nightmare, this. So again, so just to try and give you an impression why this might be important. So this is the actual figure of doom. Yeah? So, so this is the green box... Oops, sorry... Uh, the green boxes are, are molecules that are high when you eat a healthy diet. The red boxes are molecules that are high when you eat an unhealthy diet. Yeah? So if we just take one of them to try and... And these two people at the bottom here are people who have the same response to the diet. So they, if you measured their blood glucose, they would have the same response to the diets that we give them. But you can just tell by the colours. So the, 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 the little bits here are linking metabolic pathways. So these little lines here are linking metabolic pathways. So if we just highlight one of them, let's take glucose. So why should we have variability in response? So hopefully this will work. So what you have here is that those pathways that are highlighted. This here is the actual enzyme glucose 6-phosphate. And again, some of you might have switched off now and decided to take a little bit of a sleep. But for other people, it might be, you know, close to what they're doing in A-levels, and for others, it might be fresh in the mind. But the important thing is here is the top orange box are the genes that actually control that enzyme. The box below it are the enzymes themselves. And the point is here, you've got lots of possibilities on why this variability might occur. Because it could be difference in your genetic code in any of those, those four genes. It could be difference in the enzymes and the way that the enzymes are particularly working. Have they been um, uh, epigenetically modified, for example, in that person compared to the others? And that results, even though these people have the same blood glucose, in different pathways being used. How many people have I lost so far? <laughs> okay. So here, let's again pray that this works, just to try and get over what I'm trying to say. This little video here might help. So these are two people, same blood glucose, they eat the same thing. And then they want to travel from St Mary's Hospital for some reason. We thought we'd put book, Booking Palace on because it was uh, important. Along the same route. One decides to go by a motorbike and one decides to go by a pushbike. And not surprisingly, the person on the motorbike even though you're going down the same route, wins the race. Yeah? So two exa exactly the same pathway, you could see the actual mode of transport as enzymes, or whatever you want to actually see it. Well, they end up in the same place, but different, different modes of transport. And the same, it could be the possibility, same route, motorbike goes one way, but the actual bicycle decides to go through high Park. So again, using different pathways to get to the same end. So, and this is this is could be very very important. This could actually understand be some of the actual delicate understanding of why nutrients, how nutrients actually play a role in uh, in in slight changes in metabolism, which are very difficult for us to pick up at the present time. Oops. 
And so some of this is coming to the fore a bit more. So here, this is actually food on one side. These are, are, are G-protein coupled receptors in the other, and work that we're doing with Aileen Han Hanalugu at the present time is focusing on how these receptors behaviour changes when they're presented with different molecular storms of food. The same as what you would see postprandially in the ileum or in the colon. So what happens to these receptors? Because when they move and sit together, they behave differently. So that, that short-chain fatty acid receptor that I was just talking about beforehand, when it gets a partner, it signals in a completely and utterly different way. So we believe that, that some of what you've just seen on those metabolic maps, the differences between people, is driven by that. And I'm going to leave you just with another cartoon just to try and summarise what I think the actual future or the application of this could, could, could be. Just here, so I'll just leave you with that. So we eat food, a body that food produces molecules. Those molecules can be measured in the urine or you can pick another platform, whichever one, any biofluid that you want. And you can relate that to the, directly to the food that you eat. Now, we have a problem because we haven't got a methodology where people report ac accurately. This can get over that. It's very quick and simple. It has to be, and it can be done at scale. And what it will actually end up doing is it will actually revolutionise the way that we can actually give dietary advice to that, those individuals. So if personal nutrition is important, which I think we all that, that we've, we agree that it is, then these methodologies need to be embraced and they need to be translated into systems that actually work. Oops. So I'll leave you with a few messages that have, reflect this morning that the food environment we have is critical to long-term health. Food itself is complicated. It contains thousands of molecules. We heard that society this morning is complicated, but the stuff that we put our, in our mouths is very complicated. The metabolism it goes through is very complicated and we need to embrace new ways of thinking. We need to move away from the idea that we've got one molecule, one receptor. But least of all, it's fun. And that's very, very important because people that are coming to this environment, it, it's incredibly stressful, uh, but, you know, the rewards are great. And as a community, if we can learn to love one another and support one another, it will be fantastic and nutrition will be in very safe hands as we move forward. So I'll leave you with the people that should be here today to do this, because it's those people that stand behind all of that work that you saw. So thank you very much. Gary, for that. I think that was a wonderful lecture. I hope everybody enjoyed it. And it was great that your wife was able to come along. So to, uh, that's, I think, the end of what the uh, programme for today. I hope you've all enjoyed it. And uh, I'm sure everybody will take something from this. Uh, I think we've had some great talks. Um, and safe journey home, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.